everyone. Welcome all to the Snail Trail 4x4 Podcast. If you like going out farting in Toyotas, renting on Toyotas, camping in Toyotas, and maybe even talking a little bit of fun at Toyotas, and of course, hearing about how fantastic it is to rip in his 60s out from under Toyotas and put them under Jaguars, then this is the podcast for you. That's it, ladies and germs. My name is Tyler, and joining me for another episode today, episode 530, which is like, I think that's 530. Uh, we got Jimmy and Jet in the house over there. How you doing, man? Good. Good. How are you? Doing pretty good. Is that a new Land Cruiser? Yeah. That is one of the new Land Cruisers. Yeah, I know. I don't think I've ever seen that shirt yet. Well, you didn't go to this event. I know. <laughs> <laughs> you decided sad. to go off and have a child. Mm. So you couldn't go play with me. Mm, sad. Sad face. I know. He likes playing with me. It's true. Very, <laughs> very true. It does. It does. It, yeah, it happens. You know, when Jimmy and I get together, we play. So, <laughs> truth. <laughs> uh, earmuffs for all the kids out there. Anyways, so yeah, welcome uh, back to a Monday episode here. Yeah. Hopefully you had a great weekend. We did. Cool. Definitely. We'll talk about that on Thursday. Sweet. Fine. I was going to ask you now, but if you don't want to wait until Thursday, or if you do want to wait until Thursday. What? I didn't what say a thing. I'm just <laughs> getting excited for my trip coming up here tomorrow over to uh, Tennessee, Ooh. which I can't really talk about. But I also talked a little bit in depth on Thursday's episode. So, well, mm. if you're interested in what's going on there, go listen to Thursday's episode. Perfecto. But we'll get into that. I am going to be pretty close to our interviewee today because oh. he lives fairly close to where I'm going to be. Are you going to meet up and uh, play? I don't know. I would <laughs> love to meet up at a bar and grab a drink with them for uh, sure. I don't know. Um, after the, after him saying that he doesn't even cuss, I'm not even sure if he drinks, but you know, <laughs> I think if you're a, a, if you own a Jeep, we'll go that far with the hint uh, of who it is. If in case you didn't figure out by the title, then you probably drink. Yeah. yeah. That'd be my guess. All right. I don't know. We'll see. But anyways, I think that's going to be a lot of fun. I know about the trip coming up and I think you're going to have a blast. I think you're going to get treated like a VIP and a celebrity. I think you're going to get five course meals. I think that you're going to get um, somebody wipe your butt for you. That'd be awesome. Can yeah. I, how do I get one of those? <laughs> you, I bet he's about to walk in the door right now. Oh, nice. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, I think you're going to have a great trip. Um, I'm excited to hear all about it when you get back. Yeah. Uh, as soon as we're allowed to release the content, yep. we're not sure when that is yet, but we will tell you all about it when we can tell you about it. Today, though, we have a gentleman here, which we're going to be continuing the Onyx Build Challenge interviews with. And I got to say, I might like his build the best out of everybody we've been interviewing so far. Really? Why do you think that is? I, it's just, it's a, it's a crazy combo. That's you true. Have, you have, like, with what Colt is doing, he's taking a an older car that's kind of a famous style car. Yeah. And and building a real a real cool chassis under it, but it's kind of like a, I don't want to say common chassis. It's a more common chassis than I think what this guy's doing. Yeah, Nate is doing something really cool where he's building a a rock crawling dually. Yeah, okay, <laughs> which is which is fun. I'm just not a big truck fan. I don't know what it is about trucks. Yeah, I I don't I'm I'm like okay that body doesn't excite me though that Nate's using the okay. chassis and suspension that Colt is using doesn't really excite me the uh, car body does though I'm like that's pretty cool to see that as an off roader yeah but what this guy is doing it's a really cool body that you never see as an off roader no never and a chassis that you I don't I I've never seen one but I'm sure somebody's done it out there maybe. I, but it's just, I, I would have never have thought about putting these two things together. Okay. Yeah. It's a very unique build. That is for sure. Yeah. So anyways, we're going to talk to him today. Before we do, we're going to do a quick housekeeping. Uh, we have giveaways we're doing. You guys know where to find them. Perfect. How, how quick, is that it? Was that quick <laughs> enough for <laughs> good, good enough for me? <laughs> yeah. Get in for yeah. the, um, the review giveaway over on iTunes. Mm -hmm. You can win some awesome tires or an Onyx off-road elite membership, yep. uh, at our key points of 750 reviews or 700 reviews. Mm -hmm. Uh, let's see what we've got the Walter giveaway happening, yep. uh, where you go buy some Walter tools and, uh, or parts that it's consumables and send us a photo. 
and send them a photo and you get entered for those giveaways. There's a new Walter giveaway going on mm -hmm. that I got sent information about, oh. about a back to school giveaway. <laughs> I'm not a hundred. It's on Instagram and I think it's only tag some friends. Okay. So if you follow Walter, you should because of our giveaways. Everybody tag me. Everybody tag Tyler. <laughs> uh, and uh, whoever is the person tagging is going to win some Oh, good the swag. swag. The people being tagged don't win? I don't think so. I think it's... That's so you have bullshit. to go on there and tag everybody. We need to... Uh, that's way too much effort. We need to tell Walter <laughs> to have them and a buddy win the yeah. way we do ours. That's obviously our that best way, giveaway. That way I can get entered without having to do anything. I like <laughs> it. Uh, is there... And then this month's giveaway is with Gear Wrench Tools uh -huh. on our Snail Squad forums. Yep. And setups and membership. Yep. So right. lots of giveaways Good. going on as always. That's uh that does it, man. Sounds great. All right, let's get into our interview today. Really fun guy with a really fun build. Not a mushroom though. Oh, that's that even goes hand in hand with what we did today. Mushrooms. You'll you'll hear about that at the end of the episode, okay. I guess. So really fun dude. Uh, a, a kind of an iconic name in YouTube content creation. Absolutely. So uh, we have Matt here from Bleep and Jeep. So everybody grab your favorite drinks and learn a lot about Matt's history, where he came from, where, when he got this crazy idea in his head to do YouTube stuff, when he decided to buy a chicory <laughs> yeah. and, and figure out how to do ball joints himself that led him down this road of bleep and Jeep and uh, where he's come from, where he's been and uh, what he's doing for the Onyx build challenge, which is pretty rad. You guys want to, you'll want to hear about it. So that's all I got. Sounds good. All right, Let's everybody take a quick break. You, can I do it? Yeah, go for it. Uh, you were going to do no, it. No, I don't want to do it anymore. Right. I was going to say, let's take a quick break and hear something from Brian. But I know you normally say something like, so everybody grab your favorite drinks and yeah. snacks snacks uh, and uh, your favorite edibles. I don't know. What you <laughs> <laughs> All the above. <laughs> and uh, we'll be right back. The Four Wheel Underground website just got an upgrade. Come on by and check out the new functionality, new photos, and new pricing. Finally works on mobile too. Visit fourwheelunderground.com and find your new suspension today. Oh, welcome back, ladies, gentle ladies, kiddos, doggos, all the trail dogs. Shout out to all the trail dogs out there. Um, I know that the summer season is starting to wind down as all the kids are going back to school. So that means the trail dogs get their times now. They get their, they, they're on the right, they, wrong seat now. <laughs> they get yeah. the wrong seat instead of the kids. Oh, man. We have a really fun episode for you guys today. We've been uh, interviewing all the people involved with the Onyx Build Challenge because I think uh, looking at all the builds that everybody did last year for the Onyx Build Challenge, they were kind of uh, stereotypical challenge builds per se. Yeah, uh, some yeah. There's a, there was like a common themed build in a way like yeah. it was all sort of for the most part it was all sort of you know a, a basic truck yeah i i would agree i kind of it's kind of i don't want to say basic but you know starbucks white girl basic uh <laughs> off-roading vehicles there so um this year though i'm been, we've been really excited and because everybody's doing kind of off the wall stuff it's really fun to watch really fun to see all the the off the cuff crazy builds that are happening. I think a uh, big shout out to all the builders because they really took it as like a, let's have fun this year. <laughs> they kind of took the challenge to challenge and, and made some dependable rigs last year. And I'm really excited to see how everything's coming out this year. And um, we have another build challenger here on the show today. We have Matt from bleep and Jeep. So who's building a really rad vehicle. We're definitely going to get in and talk to you, but Matt how are you doing today, man? How the hell are you? Doing great. Thanks for having me. I appreciate you guys inviting me on to the podcast. I don't do this often. I'm a quiet, quiet guy. So we'll see if I can, I can make this work. <laughs> <laughs> you wouldn't know it watching your videos. You're on all these videos as center of attention all the time. Now you're like on a podcast, you're getting your, uh, he's, he's just become shy. I know. <laughs> well, whenever, whenever I am filming myself in my own studio in my garage. I have to, I have to talk to the camera. Right. But yeah. uh, normally I'm the quiet, shy guy. Nobody <laughs> knows that. <laughs> so I, I've done a few or videos in my past. I, we, I have a snail trail four by four YouTube channel, which my side knows, but uh, you probably didn't. One of the things I 
kind of learned at my start of YouTube was to kind of put a photo of like one of my friends, like directly above <laughs> or directly below the camera. So then I always started like, Hey buddy, here's what's going on. Did you do anything like that? If since being a little shy and kind of reserved, did, how did you open up? how did you crack the shell to start talking to the camera? Well, I've been doing this now for 14 years. Holy crap. If you go back and look at some of my early stuff, even it's hard for me to watch. It's embarrassing, (laughs) but it took me a long time to open up and be able to talk to the camera. I didn't ever put pictures and on top of the camera, but I did. um, I used to have a DSLR and I would flip the screen around and you can see yourself and it's almost like you're talking to somebody you're talking to yourself, but (laughs) yeah. Um, Maybe that's what I need to go back to. We've been using GoPros and and we we can't really see ourselves in them, especially when you're shooting in high def. Yeah, yeah. That's a uh, uh, speaking of the that image of your friends. I'll, I'd yeah. like my my nude pictures back. Oh, okay. Yeah, just sure. A, <laughs> just a FYI, Jimmy. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> black sharpies came in really handy <laughs> then. <laughs> uh, that's cool, man. So you've been doing this bleep and jeep stuff for 14 years now. Yeah, we started in uh, 2010. Wow. Um, just started by accident, really. I I wanted to change my ball joints, and I was <laughs> into Jeeps since I was 16, but I I was not ever formally trained as a mechanic. I didn't really know what I was doing, and so I needed to change ball joints one day, and I was like, well, let me see what's on YouTube. That was only probably two or three years old at the time, so... Mm-hmm. Back then, you got to remember, uh, cell phones were flip phones. They didn't mm-hmm. record video, yep. so it was it was difficult um, for people to make videos because you had to have real expensive camera gear and equipment, which mm-hmm. I did because I was a wedding photographer before uh-huh. before YouTube. Okay, so I had all the camera gear, and and when I went to go look for that ball joint video, there was nothing. I mean, maybe there was one that somebody filmed with their their flip phone, and it was dark and it was sideways and and I thought, well, I've got the gear. Maybe I can I can do this. And so that's when I, I made my first video, three part series. Probably took me an hour and a half uh, over those three videos to make this this uh, ball joint. How to how to redo your ball joints? But uh, it just grew from there. People wanted to see more and more and more. And so I just kept making more and more videos. And nice. Slowly, slowly turned into this. How how big of a hammer did you use on to get the ball joints out on that first video? Oh, you got to use a five pound sled. <laughs> <laughs> a few wax, so they'll, yeah. they'll pop right out. <laughs> yep. <laughs> That's funny. Um, cool. So ball from ball joints to God, what you're doing now with the Jag is it, that's an impressive, uh, big span of growth and, um, everything that's been going that you've been doing and learning. So you're, you started as a wedding photographer, what got you into off-roading? I mean, were you were you always kind of outdoor adventure related uh, personality, family, and how how did you get started there? So when I was sixteen, I I had saved up some money for a car, and I was I knew I wanted a, a off-road vehicle. So the amount of money that I had would only get me. I, I really wanted a K five Blazer, but I couldn't <laughs> afford it. So I could get a Jeep Cherokee, or I could get a Bronco two. And I ended up getting a Jeep Cherokee. And I think that's how I got into off-roading was by accident, having that Jeep Cherokee and going mm-hmm. out with my friends uh, in mud holes, just what well, we wouldn't even consider it off-roading now, but we were just yeah. playing as kids. We didn't know any better. And it eventually just grew and grew and grew until I was on, you know, what I'm doing now, doing crazy off-road hill climbs and <laughs> obstacles. But, um, well, well, you know what they say about the, the chicories and you know, the mid eighties, Toyotas and mudding. When you combine all that together, it's the gateway, the gateway drug to off-roading and rock crawling. So yeah. <laughs> I was going to say, anytime I see a truck or Jeep or whatever covered, just covered in mud, I go rookie. Yeah. Like, <laughs> like it must be his first year, you know, first yeah. few years wheeling. Cause eventually he's going to be working under that rig and he's going to get dirt in his eye and be like, mm-hmm. I'm never going in mud again. No, nope. Like I hate it. Uh, yeah. We used to go 
And we would do donuts next to each other to spray each other with mud so that we could be the cool <laughs> kids to show up <laughs> in, uh, yeah. in high school with Jeeps covered in mud. Yeah. <laughs> I I remember I did the similar things, not not donuts next to each other, but the dirtier I can get my truck to take it to school was like a pride thing. It was just it was so funny. Just yeah. pick up the mud and smear it on the car then at that point and Oh yeah. It <laughs> yeah, it was I, any way I can get mud on there for sure. Uh I totally follow you. It's it's kind of funny because you're you're pretty much on the other side of the country from us. But the the junior high or I mean high school themed off roading thing seems to be exactly the same. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I grew up in Arlington, Texas, and it ah. was um, it was a I call it the concrete jungle. There wasn't a lot of places to go, you know, unless you were just behind the Walmart parking lot or something in the, mm-hmm. in the mud hole back there. <laughs> but uh, I eventually in 2008, I moved to East Tennessee and I don't regret it at all. I got away from that city life. I'm able to live out in the country. Now we have one of the biggest off-road parks, uh, Windrock, yep. really close by. It's only 45 minutes from me and nice. there's all kinds of great off-roading opportunities out here. Excellent. So how did your parents, uh, were they into off-roading? Did the, you know, how did the drive for you to get, want to get a four by four for your first vehicle? Where did that come from? No, my dad is completely opposed to off-roading. He did have, (laughs) um, when I was growing up, he had a 1991 Toyota pickup and I actually rebuilt that for him recently, uh, in a whole series of videos. So, um, we, we completely went through it and redid everything it's like a new truck now but anyway mm-hmm. he had that did Toyota you keep the 3 in it or what's it, that did you keep the 3 engine in there or did you swap it or was it a 22 re what engine did you end up rebuilding it was a 22 re we didn't have to okay. rebuild it because my dad he takes care of his vehicles so that's why he's not into <laughs> off-road is because he thinks i'm just destroying vehicles yeah and he is the opposite he wants to keep them beautiful and immaculate forever that's so boring though (laughs) (laughs) well yeah the amount of money we pay for parts though you know (laughs) that's why he's laughing at us yeah like you broke what again yeah (laughs) he did have a um uh, an older toyota back when i was really young about five years old and we kind of rebuilt and, and repainted that but uh so is he no, into he never, restoring vehicles then, or is he just into like just keeping vehicles looking good? Uh, he was into hot rods whenever he uh, was he was younger. Okay, but now he doesn't even know how to change his brakes. So I'm not <laughs> sure what all he did with hot rods, but they would go up and down the the strip in Arlington, Texas, and pick up girls. I think. There we go. All right. <laughs> yeah, for sure. <laughs> well, is, is it the fact that he d- forgot how to change brakes or is it now that you're a good enough mechanic to do it for him? <laughs> His joke's on you. He's like, I don't know. I'm not going to change brakes anymore. We got Matt doing Did he follow you to Tennessee or is he still in Texas? How's, how's that work? Uh, he's in Arkansas. So oh. he lives out in the middle of nowhere in Arkansas. Oh, but okay. A little I'll help him every once in a while, but he's a little, he's 600 miles from here. Yeah, a, a little far for you to drive over to change the brakes for sure. Right. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's funny. Uh, all right. So he kind of do. You, yeah. I'm still kind of curious as to why the off-roader for your first vehicle, why not, I don't know, a mid nineties Corolla or a uh, uh, Honda Civic or something that <laughs> why, why go into a four by four? What, what was the draw there? I don't know. It's been so long ago. I just <laughs> remember there was um, another kid who had this jacked up K five blazer. And I thought, man, that is so cool. When he'd pull into the parking lot, he wouldn't even pull off of the the road. He would just go right through the grass. And I thought, (laughs) I want to do stuff like that, you know. (laughs) But uh, once I got that Cherokee, it already had a little bit of a lift on it, some Mm -hmm. big tires. And we started going going four-wheeling, hanging out with people. Uh, And I did a whole story of this on the the Vin Wiki YouTube uh, a couple months ago. But uh, how I got into into it really as I broke down um, out in the middle of nowhere and these Jeep people just came out of the woods and uh, Toyota guys too they came out of the woods and just started helping me um, <laughs> put this thing back together did you have and a welder going or something no we we actually broke the um, the lift block so I had put some oh. like aluminum lift blocks on mm-hmm. the rear leaf springs and 
those broke in half and the axle kind of turned sideways up underneath the, oh, the Jeep. And these guys, I didn't know what to do. I was kind of panicking, but these guys came out of the woods and they were like little MacGyvers and just started helping <laughs> me. With that. By the end of it, I had two by fours shoved in place instead of the aluminum blocks. And I drove all the way home, probably 20 miles in front wheel drive without a rear drive shaft. There you go. And the fact that those guys came to the rescue and were able to help and fix the situation, it, it just was really cool. And I think that's what got in my head how, how neat of a, a hobby this was. Yeah, it's a, it's pretty fun. That's one of the reasons why I now carry scissor jacks with me so that if I blow my, my lift blocks, I can put a scissor jack in there. And then you also have a changeable lift while you're going too. So if you need a little <laughs> bit more lift out of your suspension, you can just crank it up real quick and it just... I don't know if that would work. <laughs> no, <Come on. laughs> I'm not sure it'll hold it. But uh, no, it's no. funny. Uh, going, we're we're really close to Fordyce and Rubicon, so we're out, you know, doing that stuff all the time. And it's uh, I mentioned the welder because anytime you start welding on the trail or like down at Buck Island or something, and just the flashes in the trees, it's just funny how many off roaders come over. That's like meerkats. Just you don't know, come over and they poke their heads out of the trees behind bushes. They're like, Oh, what there's fi- shiny flash things going on over here. Oh, somebody's welding. And then you just end up with a crowd around you. <laughs> so. They probably think it's aliens going to see what's going on there. <laughs> yeah. Especially I, at Buck this, Island. Yeah. yeah. I don't like carrying a welder because once you are the guy with the welder, you're that guy. And when people yeah. break down, even if it's 20 or 50 miles away, they're like, Hey, I know a guy. Know. He's got a welder. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I'm sure. Yeah. Tyler probably gets calls over the repeater for somebody that's broken on the Rubicon for him to go up and try to fix them. Like, luckily, I it's not me. It's usually either uh, John Arns or John Allen, one of those two guys, or, sure. or uh, Glenn or the, or the buns. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, yeah, for sure. Cool. So uh, what did you end up, did you do anything to the Cherokee when you got it or did it just sort of stay stock and then you moved on or wh- what happened there? How long do you have it for? So I had it for 20 years, actually. I made it really nice. And then in college, I painted it, uh, I had it or I painted, I had it painted at Mako. Uh, back then it was $750 for a complete oh, paint wow. job at Store Jams <laughs> inside of the the hood and all. Wow. But it was beautiful. And then whenever I moved to East Tennessee, I started hanging out with a different crowd because uh, I, I was cool. I, I was on 36 inch tires and I thought, man, that's pretty good for a chicory. How much tubbing did you have to do for those? How much what? Tubbing? Did you have to tub the cab or the, Cut anything? the fenders or Cut anything? The fenders, nothing? No, I had to do the rear chop and fold. Okay. It's what they call it on a Cherokee. Okay. But uh, I moved the fenders up and uh, we had, a, I think, a six and a half inch lift on it. But when I moved to East Tennessee and started hanging out with this other crowd, they were much more hardcore than I realized. And eventually the thing turned into a raisin. Yeah. Uh, I beat it. I beat it all the glass out of it. I beat all the doors up. I ended up having no doors, no tailgate, no glass. And eventually I had to scrap it. But when I built uh, my Scorpion crawler now, which is uh, Cherokee, but it's a full tube chassis crawler Mm -hmm. on 43s and one tons and and all the goodies. So did you just take, sorry, did you just take the the drive train and axles out of it and built a chassis (laughs) from that? that That was my plan, but I ended up going so overboard with the build that all I ended up with was the steering wheel and the sun visor <laughs> out of that original chair. Oh man. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I wanted to keep it forever, but it just got too beat up. I just, there was just too much, too many cracks in the frame and everything. Yeah. I get that. I actually have a 91 Toyota pickup. Um, that's my crawler. It's called Bobcat and I've had it for 20 years and I'm kind of Every every day, it seems like I'm like, what should I do with this rig? Should I am I going to keep it forever, or am I going to get rid of it? Should I do a body swap on it so it has a clean body? Because mine's not raisined, but it's definitely not straight. But it's <laughs> you know, I'm all I'm in this limbo all the time of like, should I actually make it clean and like have it be a nice rock crawler, or get rid of it and just actually build something big? Or 
Yeah, There's maybe no such thing as a nice rock crawling. <laughs> if you do, That's you're true. doing it wrong. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, true. It it would get a dead for sure eventually. But yeah, I've I'm I'm in that boat, right? I've had my truck for 20 years, and it's like I'm gonna keep it forever. And then the next day, I'm like, I need to sell it so I can buy more parts for the next build, or you know, <laughs> it, you never know. It was so sad. If I had to do it all over again, I would um, I would not take it wheeling and just buy a beater, but. It, at the time, it was the only Jeep I had, and, and I took it. I actually drove it to the trails and beat it up and then drove it back. And, mm-hmm. and eventually, I got a trailer. Once you get a trailer, though, it's all downhill from there because you start beating your, your stuff up so bad that, you know. Yeah. All you, you have to do is get it back to the trailer. Jeep. Yeah. <laughs> so, okay, cool. So, you kept the rig around for 20 years. You, that's when you started Bleeping Jeep is working on that Cherokee what was the how was did the progression of YouTube happen? Well, like I said, I made one video and then I made another video. People liked it. Uh, you know, I'm getting hundreds of views and then thousands of views and comments. And uh, back then, people wanted more and more because there wasn't really there was no content back then. Mm-hmm. Um, there was no how to content for off roaders. The only people around back then was the Way of Life and. Uh, busted knuckle off road and mad ram mm. and that was it for off road content and when i when i actually first started out i had it it kind of changed direction so my first idea was to take videos of off road content and kind of put all the best content that i could find of the day out there i had a website it's still the same website but it's changed over the years but it it was just kind of taken all the fails and the wins and the cool off-road content of the day and posting it all on that website. It was kind of like a blog, I guess, for the, the best off-road content. So sort of like a, back in the day, was that a killsometime.com or what were some of the other ones that were essentially like that? I don't know. Okay. Uh, yeah. <laughs> like the chive or whatever. <laughs> now the YouTube algorithm is, is good enough to point you to all the best content naturally. Yeah. But back then there was no algorithm for you to find the content was, was hard. So I would sit there every day and find all the best content and then post it on the website. And that's where people would go. And then I started making videos of my own and realizing, you know, that's, that's the way I needed to go in the future rather than um, sharing everybody else's content was making my own. Yeah. So there's a, there's a, there's a a certain point at which um, entrepreneurs go from crazy to insane where they're, they're no longer working a, a job like a salary job or anything. And they go to depending on their own business for all their income and everything. And they make this mental switch in YouTube land, um, content creators going from whatever they're doing for income to just kind of solely relying and making YouTube their full-time job. That's a, that's a big leap for a lot of people. And that to make that switch, when did that happen for you? Was it kind of an overnight thing where you realized I could, this, this is, there's a potential here or was it a pretty gradual thing until you're kind of like, Oh, Oh shit. This is, this has making enough money where I can just do this full time and, and work on and focus on this. Or was it, did you try and force it and make it happen? I guess. No, for me, it was very gradual. So I quit my uh, photography in 2015. Uh, Um, Up until that point, all my friends thought I was crazy. You know, (laughs) they would, Nobody understood how you could make money on YouTube back then. Mm-hmm. Now, uh, you know, everybody kind of understands how it works, but mm-hmm. they were like, what you're doing? What, why are you, why are you making all these videos for people and you're not making any money off of it? And I was like, well, it's growing, you know, one, one year you'd make X amount. And then the next year you'd make double that. And even though it wasn't much, I could see it ramping up. Mm-hmm. Nobody understood and eventually in 2015 i started making more money on youtube than i did doing my photography business okay and i thought you know what i was doing weddings and it was really every every weekend my stomach would just be in knots because <laughs> there's so many things that can go wrong doing a, a photo shoot for a wedding uh we started out on film so back then uh, in the early days you had to switch out the the film every 24 or 36 shots um, when we went to digital, we had new problems in that you had a card that would fill up, right? Mm-hmm. And 
if you didn't switch out that card fast enough, maybe they're on their first kiss and you missed that. There's no going back. Yeah. You're gonna get you're gonna get sued if you don't capture that shot. <laughs> and yeah. not only that, but if the card fails, which happened once, uh, you know, you lose probably two hundred images. I would shoot on small cards and switch them out every so often just so that I wouldn't have a card fail or lose a card. Lose the whole anyway, thing. Yeah. That that was so much stress on me. I decided, why am I doing this when I could be making off-road content, which is what my hobby was up until that point. Mm -hmm. um, and I really loved doing doing videos and working out in my shop and my garage. If I was retired today, I would still just go out and tinker in my shop and build cars. So. Okay. That was going to be my next question. Um, because a lot of times also people who take their hobby and turn it into their job and to their career kind of thing, burnout happens a lot too. And all of a sudden they're like, man, I, I don't like my hobby anymore because I have to, I'm forced to do it now in order to pay the bills and it becomes another stress in by itself. So, um, you haven't gotten that way though. You still would just be out doing your hobby if you didn't have the YouTube job side of it too. Yeah. Burnout is a, is a real thing. And I think YouTube's algorithm is really pushing people to burn out. Mm. It's changed a lot over the years with, with the algorithm instead of people watching what they're subscribed to now they watch what what they're going to click bait on so if people mm -hmm. click bait on cats it's going to start showing them a thousand cat videos and then they won't even see off-road videos even though they're subscribed to off-road videos mm -hmm. it's kind of a shame but um i i at one point i was making three videos a week and wow that's a lot <laughs> I, I sat back and was like you know what this isn't worth it i'm gonna do what i'd I want to do and I'm going to spend time with my family, with my kids. That's more important. And I'm going to make one video a week, maybe two, if I can manage it that week. But, uh, I, about a year or two, maybe two, two or three years ago, I just said one video a week is enough for me. Mm -hmm. Did you find that when it comes to content creators, as long as the content creator is enjoying what they're doing and having a true a genuine enjoyment out of it that translates to people enjoying the content a lot more. And people can tell when you're getting burned out, when you're not enjoying it, when you're not genuine about it anymore. Right. And so did you find that people uh, that you're, you, your following dropped off when you did one video a week, or did you find that people still enjoyed the content just as much? Did you notice a change in how your viewers viewed you and perceived you? by dropping off to one video, quote unquote, dropping off in order to maintain your sanity? <laughs> the viewers don't like it. Obviously, they want to see if, if they had their, their say, we'd be doing one video a day. <laughs> yeah. But so they want to see as much content as possible. And I, I realized that early on. And that's why I started to bring on other content creators. Mm -hmm. So uh, for a long time, I had, I probably had Maybe 10, 15 people come, oh, that many. come through the gates of Bleep and Jeep. Okay. Uh, we employed them and, and they would make videos as well. And uh, I think at one time, we probably had four, maybe five content creators. But eventually they have other things that they want to do or they leave or they start their own channels. Um, but we've had a lot of good guys come through Bleep and Jeep. Mm -hmm. Yeah, we've uh, you know we've had the chance to talk with Nate uh, from Dirt Lifestyle, and uh, we just uh, talked to Colt from Colt Builds It, and both both of those people actually uh, are, went through your program, you know, or the, <laughs> we'll so say, and you know you gave them the the foot up to eventually start building their own platform. So I think that's it's actually a really cool thing that you did, and a, a way of thinking, you know, of like bringing creators in to kind of have content every day, but you didn't have to create the content every day. Mm -hmm. And on the flip side, you're kind of giving an opportunity or opening the doors for somebody that is interested in doing this to step into a platform that already has an audience mm -hmm. so they can kind of um, step themselves up as well. Yeah. They don't call me the OG for no reason. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. It's the old grandpa. That's what they <laughs> is that what it that's what it goes for? Okay. Yeah. OG, <laughs> old grandpa. <laughs> nice. Excellent. 
You know, a question that I've I've been wondering, and this is maybe stepping just a hair back in the way that we're talking about things, is where did the actual name Bleep and Jeep come from? Is there a, a good story behind that, or is it just you can't say fucking Jeep on YouTube? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> well, you can't say that on YouTube, but uh, I, I made that original video that I told you about for the ball joints, um, and I was talking to the wife. I was like, well, if we're going to make a YouTube channel we have to call it something what should we call it and and i had no idea i went through all these names i wrote out lists of names and eventually i was like you know what i'm always i'm always cursing at my jeep everybody says jeep is just empty every pocket yeah they're never running they're always they're always um trashed there's always something wrong with them why don't we just call it bleeping jeep <laughs> okay <laughs> so just, yeah it stuck. is right in line huh yeah, yeah okay I was curious if it, if there was another meaning behind it or if it was just the insert cuss word. Yeah. Right. <laughs> so you're out on the trail and you you break another ball joint on the trail. You're just like, oh, God, this fucking Jeep. What is this? <laughs> <laughs> oh, hey, that's a good channel. Name. Yeah, for well, sure. Don't, what people don't know is I don't cuss either. So oh. um, so for me to be, call it bleeping Jeep is perfect because I don't have to say the other things. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> nice. Well, uh, we did, uh, I don't know if it was an after hours with Colt or something, but we did learn that you also had, uh, children at a younger age. And, uh, is that, uh, th- is that one of the reasons you don't cuss or is, have you just never really cussed and it just having kids around just fell in line with that? Uh, I, I don't know. We had kids in high school and so I was, I went from a kid to having kids as a kid and never really felt the need to cuss. So there, Mm. There was, I have other words to express my sure my anger <laughs> rather than cussing. I don't know. I don't know that. Yeah, no, for I, sure. I, I admire that. I can't do it. So <laughs> he, he, said, he speaks like a sailor, yeah, right? Yeah. yeah, he's actually the complete opposite. He's like, I'm pretty much going to teach my kid to cuss yeah. and teach him the proper ways, the to proper cuss. way to use it. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, not to insult people, but to use it as actual descriptors when the time counts to use the word. So, yeah, well. When having kids, the one time a curse word does slip out, they know you mean business. Yeah, if true. you're cussing all the time, they really can't tell. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's fair. <laughs> Going down this rabbit hole uh, yesterday, my daughter said fudge. And yeah. it's the first time I've heard her say like a, a fake cuss word, uh-huh. you know, and <laughs> use it in in like a way to, you know, at, in a conversation. And I kind of, it caught me, you know, I was like, wait. That just happened. So she's she's <laughs> catching on to all these, you know, like the cuss words and what's bad. And then now kind of using them. She's also 10. Right. <laughs> so uh, it's kind of a really interesting time for her. I think just body and mental status where she's tr- really becoming herself, which is yeah. kind of a fun thing. So I almost I, really, think- I almost brought it up and I almost was like, were you going to say fuck? No, like, <laughs> were you, what was going to happen there? Did you, did you just cover it or do you like... Let's see, you know, but I don't know. Do you have any advice for me? Cause uh, do you like, how did that work? Did when your kids started thinking about that? I think cursing is a learned thing from your parents. So I would assume if you guys curse, then probably your parents did too. But, um, no, my kids, they don't, they don't cuss cause we didn't cuss. I think, I think that's probably how it goes. I would assume. Mm, yeah. Well, that's mm. interesting. That's a good way to put it. I mean, I don't really cuss that often. It will come out of it eventually. My wife, on the other hand, is much more of a potty mouth than I am. (laughs) My parents didn't really cuss. So that uh, does make sense that it's kind of an inherited trait in a way. Interesting. So my parents never cussed. They were very straight edge around me. So I'm not sure what happened there. You have to be your your friends. (laughs) Yeah, Yeah, exactly. (laughs) Were you in the military? No. Uh -uh. Uh-uh. Uh-uh. He's just a black sheep somewhere. Yeah, Yeah. (laughs) I did. I did grow up at a private school, though. Very, very Christian, very, very pressure, dogmatic school. And I was always against that. So that uh, maybe the rebelliousness of private school growing up was what pushed me over the edge. I don't know. You'll have to speak to your psychiatrist. I know, right? <laughs> <laughs> There's some Freudian thing in there somewhere. Yeah. I don't know. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right. Well, let's uh, let's jump back in here. Uh, let's talk about the Onyx Build Challenge. Uh, mm-hmm. Let's talk about last year first, mm-hmm. and then moving forward. You did participate last year, if I recall. Um, what did you do, and how did what was the outcome there? 
So uh, we built the S10 last year. Colt took the reins on that build and built it in his place, which is 2,000 miles away from here. <laughs> yeah. Uh, so I went and flew down there twice to help him out with that build. And we actually ended up uh, winning the competition last year and got to go on the ultimate adventure with the S10. Yeah. Which, yep. was, which is seven days of, of off-roading at a different park seven different parks <laughs> yeah. and seven different days all over the, the country, which was crazy. Mm -hmm. Was that your first time going on an ultimate adventure? It was. Yeah. Isn't it like every off-roaders life dream <laughs> to go on one of those things? what do you think? Did, was it just jaw dropping the entire time? <laughs> there was a lot of cool scenery, a lot of cool trails that I got to see. It was a really neat experience, but I think everybody should do it at least once, but <laughs> Once was enough for me. <laughs> yeah. I watch I watch a lot of the ultimate adventures and I'm just like this whole time like, yeah, it's cool. But man, I would be so stressed out to make sure that the rig is holding together for the next day and the next day and the next day. I'm like, it just seems like a ton of stress in order to keep up with the group. It it is stressful. And if you break down even on the road, uh, they just keep going. Yeah. You just... <laughs> exactly. That's that, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like the top gear status. Good uh, luck. Yep. See, See you later. later. <laughs> yeah. That's exactly how it is. Um, but everybody was able to keep up. They do have some guys they'll send back to help you out. Uh, the cronies. The cronies. Yep. But um, it was stressful, but we got through it. We lived and. I think I'm done. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. I, I could understand that. Yeah. It does seem. I mean, every day just wheeling is is fun, uh, but the stress and the amount of uh, the difficulty of those trails that you guys do is just it's it's unreal. Mm -hmm. And then to do it over again the next day and the next day and the next day and you know keeping the vehicle alive and then having a day every day you're moving you know and having to pack up and pack uh, clean up camp and make camp and everything yeah it it definitely sounds like a lot of work. We've done something similar, um, probably 2019. 2020 trail mm -hmm. to SEMA. Oh uh, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, that was a good time. It was, it was seven days, maybe four different off-road parks, two or three States, but I prefer trailering. I, all of my vehicles are trailer Queens. They don't see the road. They're more purpose built for rock crawling and doing gnarly obstacles. So I've never really had a rig that I could drive two or 300 miles and then off-road. Yeah. Um, just not my style, not really what we do around here in East Tennessee. Yeah. You guys have to have, I mean, here on the West coast, we have gr awesome traction. Like we have great traction services. Uh, blue granite is great unless it gets a little bit wet, but it's, it's, we just have big rocks that we just need a ton of articulation and we can use 22 REs that have, you know, 50 horsepower to get up and over and through this stuff. Cause we have such good traction, but on the East coast, you guys don't have good traction and you have these big ass rocks too. So you really need to almost launch vehicles up and over stuff at points. And it's just, it's a completely different mentality of a, how to build a vehicle uh, for off-roading and B, how do you, how do you get it around so that you can go and play with it on the obstacles, but then get it back home too. So it's yeah, just different mentality. Yeah, I tell people uh, I live in a rainforest here. They don't really realize that uh -huh. Tennessee, Tennessee, East Tennessee is like a rainforest, but this is rock bouncer territory. Mm -hmm. You're running stickies, you're running 43s, you're running the biggest massive axle shafts and drive drivetrain imaginable, the highest horsepower you can get. Uh, you don't need a lot of flex. Um, you just try to send it as fast as you can up the hill because if, if you don't make it, you're just going to slide back down to the bottom. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah, <laughs> for sure. Well, uh, let's talk about this year's Onyx Build Challenge and what you guys have going on for that. We kind of hinted at it at the beginning, but why don't you give us a rundown of the thought process of you know, what you did last year and how you decided on the vehicle that you chose this year? Yeah, so last year was more of an overlander competition. This year, they said, you know, at first that we were starting out building overlanders. We had to drive them. We had to have a maximum of 37 inch tire. All that slowly changed. And so my build <laughs> kind of slowly changed. But what we've ended up with is a um, 85 Jaguar XJ6 that is going uh -huh. on top of a 12 valve Dodge Cummins. No, shit. We, we, took awesome. the, we took the Dodge Cummins 
body off and we're body swapping it over basically, but we're still having to customize everything because it's not just going to be a Dodge W250 when we're done. This is going to be a serious rock crawler that's capable of some serious rocks. Mm -hmm. But um, we've got 42 inch uh, super swampers that are going on it. It's going to have a ton of travel. It's going to have, it's it's actually a truck. So since this is a podcast, I'm going to have to, you're going to have to picture this in your mind, right? So we took this we took this car and we cut it in half right behind the, the fourth door. So the, the rear door, the C pillars area. Yeah. Mm-hmm. And then we're, we, we built that back and then we're making it into a truck. So it's going to have a flatbed <laughs> wrecker basically on the back. Mm-hmm. Uh, it's, it's pretty tall. It's pretty big. It's almost 12 foot wheelbase. 12 feet 100, wheelbase, 144, yeah, 140 something inches. Nice. Uh, so it's going to be a monster truck, but uh, it's similar to the Matt's off-road world's heart, world's largest wrecker, mm-hmm. except it's a Jaguar. <laughs> so are you going to have are you going to have a winches and crane and everything off the back too? We are. Uh, that's the goal. We're not going to we're not going to be as serious with the uh, the wrecker part of it, but mm-hmm. it is. We plan on having a boom and a winch yeah. uh, on the rear, winch on the front, of course. We do get people that are stuck out here at Windrock. Maybe I'll try my luck at, at going and, and retrieving some of these people. Yeah. But um, are you going to be submitting it to the, the record games as well then next year? So the record games was only the record games the first year. And then the second year it was the off-road games. Okay. Uh, they, they switched it. So he said I could bring it if I want to bring it. But um, <laughs> we're having to build another vehicle for that as well. Which okay. I, I can't discuss at this point, I don't think. <laughs> Fair deal. Well, we'll hit the stop recording button and we can talk about it later. So we- <laughs> <laughs> you know, I thought that uh, when he first said 12 feet, I was like, oh my gosh, that's so long. But then I got to thinking it's a, a quad cab long bed Tacoma. Yeah, pretty much. Is, they're 143, yeah, I believe. 140. I just looked it up. 145. Oh, 140. Okay. Yeah. So they're an inch longer and people off-road those, overland those all the time. So it's not, it's not that much. So that's... For- Kind of for a rock crawler that may, maybe for an overlander for a rock crawler that is really really long yeah um, especially when you have trees in the mix so the thing <laughs> we have a lot of here <laughs> sure. is, is trees and getting around and through those trees and snaking through is, is difficult so uh, we're on a budget of twenty thousand dollars unfortunately which i've already just about maxed out but i have to keep this thing so maybe when we bring it back after sema um, i'll be able to Add some more things to it. You got to do some rear steer to help you get around those trees. <laughs> yeah. I think I might have to at 40 <laughs> inches long. Yeah. yeah, for sure. So what axles are you going to be running? That's Dana 60s front and rear. Obviously, my ultimate choice would have been a 14 bolt rear. But what we ended up doing was we bought we bought the Dodge W250 with the diesel and used it. We bought the Jaguar and used it. And then we bought a Toyota that was already built rock crawler. Um, since we're on a budget, it was cheaper to buy an entire Toyota built rock crawler with 60s than it was just to build the 60s from the Dodge. <laughs> wow. Yeah, I, I, it, it I had, believe it. It had tires. It had wheels. It had a lot of components like fuel cell and uh, window and uh, batteries and winches that we wouldn't have gotten if we just built the Dodge Dana six. Yeah. Nice. Yeah. That's, I mean, it's, it's crazy to think about, but we always dump all this money into rock crawlers and it's never the flashy, shiny stuff. So it's, it's like overlanding vehicles. You get the flashy, shiny stuff and people are willing to pay more money for it. But you're talking about built Dana sixties. There's a very few subset of people in the off-roading world that really knows the true value of those. (laughs) And so it's like, it's, it's, you buy them just the sixties themselves. And it's like, Oh yeah, they're, you're looking for that market that knows what those axles are and are looking for those axles. But if you sell a whole crawler, that's, you know, maybe got a raise into body, but all the good stuff is underneath it that nobody ever sees the people that know that can find some really great deals just like you did. So it's a, yeah, it's an interesting market. All the time, if you want to build a crawler, don't just go buy one. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Cause it's way cheaper to buy somebody else's project than it is to build your own. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. Yep. 
I think I know the answer to this, but what engine are you actually using? Are you going to be using the Jaguar engine? You're going to be using that Dodge engine or the Toyota engine? <laughs> well, definitely the 12 valve from the Dodge. Yeah. yeah. The, the Jaguar engine had no power whatsoever. Mm-hmm. It was a, a straight six as well. The Toyota had a 22 R. <laughs> <laughs> That'd Not be fun work. trying to just watch that try and move the vehicle. <laughs> this thing's probably going to weigh 7,000 pounds by yeah. the time it's done, maybe more. So yeah, definitely needed that 12 valve, which comes with its own set of problems because now we have to make everything stand up to a 12 valve. Mm. So things start to add up really quick whenever you start talking about you know, shafts and um, even NP205 parts are really expensive. Yeah. All the internal gears and everything. So the axle shafts you guys are getting, you're not doing the uh, the old school Dodge 60s. Those were 30 spline, 32. Um, I think 32. Yeah. So you're are you getting everything up to 35s, 40 spline? What are you What are you doing in order to make everything stand up to that 12 valve? Well, the um, Toyota came with already pre built axles, so we're using that, which is 35 splines. 35s. Okay. Yeah. Nice. Awesome. The only thing we did, we, we ran into an issue. We didn't realize when I bought the Toyota that the, the Dana sixties were narrowed by eight inches. Each. Oh, oh. <laughs> geez. So when we got home, the, what was weird is they, they narrowed the axle eight inches and then they spaced the wheels out with offset wheels and spacers by six inches. So that's, that's why we didn't see it from the get go. Interesting. But yeah. yeah. It, it, it's going to be okay. <laughs> Why wouldn't they just get what what would be the appropriate term? Proper backspacing or offset yeah. to bring yeah, the bring wheels in, in which is which is <laughs> my thought is somebody didn't think about that and they thought it would be cool to run really narrow axles and then realized narrow is not the way to go. No. <laughs> <laughs> right. Yeah. 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 That's that's wild. Man, they uh, that so are you still using the spacers or did you widen them yourselves? Yeah, we're going to have to use the spacers for now and um, the offset wheels. Okay. Dang. And then after you get back from SEMA, you'll, you'll do the rear steer and widen the axles and all that fun stuff. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> if I get around to it, we've, we've, I've got qu- quite a few crawlers and we'll see how well it does first and mm-hmm. yeah, whether we want to continue the build or not. <laughs> sure. So how far along are you in, on this build right now? Like at what stage are you at? Um, we're measuring for drive shafts and we're about to put the body back on for the last time and then put shocks on. So wow, we'll have to do They're wiring, of course, and, and plumbing, but it's it's getting closer. Yeah. There's still a lot to do, a lot to do, but yeah, we've yeah. Got, the, we've got the time is always taken by the small things, isn't it? Mm-hmm. Like. It's it and fair, the budget. <laughs> yeah, well, yeah, for sure. You know, doing the like suspension and get well, putting the axles underneath it, and I mean, building the frame would probably have uh, modifying the frame if you had to do it in any way would definitely take some time for the precision to fit the body. But yeah, wiring and plumbing and all the electrical and everything cuts, has got to suck up so much time. Yeah, and just just getting a Jaguar to fit on top of a a Dodge, we had to cut the frame in half twice and. <laughs> move things around and we moved the engine back on the on the frame 16 inches wow and then moved the, the axle forward 12 inches and trying to get it all to mesh up was a nightmare <laughs> i can imagine what was i mean obviously packaging is probably going to be your biggest thing but what are some of the challenges that you have to overcome trying to put a 86 jaguar body on a 12 valve chassis I, it actually I, the reason i chose the jaguar is because it has a it, they came with a V12 yeah. in them also. Uh. So they have a really big hood and a lot of space for engine. Mm-hmm. So that's one of the reasons that I chose that particular car. But um, cutting it in half was probably the, the hardest part. And then I, I don't think I mentioned this yet, but it's it's kind of got a Mad Max theme to it. So we took we stripped all the paint off. So it's just shiny, bare metal. Okay. And so we're going to go with the Mad Max theme. But but getting getting the engine to fit was probably the easiest part of oh. the whole build. <laughs> okay. What was the hard parts then? Cutting it in half and then you said you had to cut the frame in half twice. What was that for? 
So we're doing a truggy out back. So we cut the the frame off in the back to to build out tube work for the for the rear and for the bed. Okay. And then we cut the frame in the middle and brought it back together because a truck has these like side valences that cover the frame. And if you just put a car on top of it, you can see the frame. So we had to we had to kind of flatten out the frame mm. uh, and take a lot of the curves out so that that body would fit on there. Gotcha. Did, how did you deal with the width of the frame for the the Dodge versus the width of the frame for the uh, Jaguar? Were they close, or did you have to actually narrow one of the frames, or how'd that work? We just kept the uh, Dodge frame the same width, but the the Jaguar is a uniframe, a unibody. Oh, okay. <laughs> okay. So it just sits on top. <laughs> that makes sense. <laughs> I've actually always, I it like. One of the weird things is I have this desire for like stupid, random old cars and a, an old school. I think yes, it's an, yes, is does. it an XJ 12? The 12 valve version of that is one of the cars that I've always enjoyed. So yeah, I'm excited to see this build just because it has the same body style. You're just not using that V12. Yeah. They had the XJ uh, six and then the XJS, which is the two door version. Okay. Uh, a little more sleek on that one. Yeah, I thought there was an X, at least an XJ8 that had the V8 one, or was that a a later uh, model? Uh, I don't know. I'm not yeah. an X. I'm an XJ <laughs> fanatic, but for Jeep. Yeah, 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 yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I don't know much about Jaguars. All I know is you should always kind of stay away from them and not uh, trust their electrical for the most part. So it's, <laughs> I'm assuming you get with all the using the engine of the Dodge that you're not using the electrical from the Jaguar. <laughs> we're, we're using the body harness of the yeah. interior electrical because it does have power windows and power things. Mm-hmm. It even has a, a sunroof. And, but what we didn't realize is the electrical is so bad. If you take out one of the switches, none of the switches work. <laughs> oh, jeez! So it's it's like a it's like Christmas lights, you know, when when yeah. one bulb goes bad, yeah. they all go bad. Yeah. So we have to keep a lot of that stuff just to have the windows work. <laughs> yeah, or else rewire the entire thing. Yeah, by yeah, that would suck. Well, awesome. I think this, uh, you got a good chance, a good fighting chance here for the, your guys' build. I can't remember. I did look at it the other day, but I'm pretty sure you guys are in first, right? On the voting? Yeah. yeah we're in dead, we're in dead last. Are so you we need all the help that we can get. <laughs> did I completely read that? Maybe I was looking at my phone upside down or yeah, something. Probably, probably. <laughs> uh, but I think your build is rad. I'm a little biased because I love the Jaguars, but mm-hmm. you know, I what I really like about this year's competition, it seems like a lot of people are building really random and different things and thinking outside of the box yeah. on how to build something. And and yours falls right in line with that. I think you're what you got going is really cool. Thank you. On the on the interview last year after they announced that we won, he's uh, Ian Johnson said, "What are you going to build for next year?" And I said, "Well, I want to do something outside the box and maybe build a car." And I thought we were going to be the only ones building a car, but no, everybody's <laughs> building a car. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> kind of. Yeah, yeah. It's a lot of fun to to watch and follow along with this year. I mean, it was fun last year because it's just kind of like. Oh yeah, what would you do on a I don't want to say a super budget, but it was it was very attainable, right? And this year it's fun in a di- completely different category because it's it's just something that's so off the wall that you're like this is just entertaining to watch this year. <laughs> yeah, everybody going, so. Yeah. Is are, is there anybody else any like sponsors or any supporters or anything that you want to uh, to kind of talk about um here at the end of the the show or maybe uh and tag on with that, how people can go to vote for you or uh, w- if they enjoy the content or where to watch that. Yeah. So you can watch all of our content on the bleep and Jeep YouTube channel. And a huge shout out to Onyx off road for the Onyx off road build challenge. That's where, who we're building this for. And you can see um, those videos on the Onyx YouTube, the Onyx off road YouTube website. I don't know if you guys can leave a link in a podcast, but if you can do that, uh, there'll be a link below for where you can go vote for us. So you don't have to be a paid member of Onyx. You just have to log in to Onyx Off-Road. And what they do is they make mapping software. I'm sure you guys know. Yeah. 
we're big fans of Onyx. We uh, we work with them and we tell everybody about how the software works. And it's a it's a really cool piece of software that uh, we're we're big fans of. We think everybody should have if you're going off roading. So yeah, it's very helpful. But mm-hmm. if you can leave a link for that, we need all the votes that we can get <laughs> because I pissed off so many people building this. I, I pissed what? off the. <laughs> the first gen Dodge owners hate me. The uh, the Jaguar people hate me for destroying a Jaguar. Yeah. The Toyota people hate me for destroying a Toyota, and the Jeep people hate me for not building a Jeep. So, <laughs> what about the Ford people? Do they just kind of like hate you because you didn't give them any attention at all? <laughs> yeah, everybody hates this here. <laughs> uh, that's funny. Well, cool, man. Thank you so much for taking, you know, an hour, hour and a half of time out of your day here. Super good luck to you. It's a lot of fun to watch. I'm glad you're you're doing this. I I enjoy the build. I'm I'm happy to see this Jaguar going on a 12 valve. It's a that's pretty rad. If people wanted to get a hold of you to ask questions and not just watch your content, is that still just through the YouTube channel or what's the best way to to ask questions or get a hold of you or or cheer you on for the build challenge? Yeah, just leave a, a comment on one of our YouTube videos. I usually respond to every question. And last, the last video we did, we actually read all of the negative hate comments. So if you want to <laughs> leave a negative hate comment, feel free. Uh, those are always fun. <laughs> do, those, do those still get you riled or here after 14 years, they don't even, they just jump off the shoulder. It doesn't even matter. Oh, it eats you up inside, but you just got to push it down, push yeah. it down deeper. <laughs> <laughs> nice. <Absolutely. laughs> well, cool, man. Awesome. Uh, if people want to get a hold of us, you guys know how to do that um, all the time. You guys can also leave us a voicemail for the snail mail segments. Uh, that's 916 345 4744. If you have a question, feedback, something for Matt, uh, leave a voicemail. Maybe we'll, uh, we'll get him on the horn and uh, play the voicemail for him and see what he has to say about him. That's always fun. If you guys want to get a hold of us, on Instagram. You guys know where to do that. Snail Trail 4x4 and 4x4 Toyota Tyler. Um, there's emails. There's the irate 4x4. There's lots of ways to get a hold of us. Lots of ways to get a hold of Matt. This has been a lot of fun. It's been fun learning about your history, Matt, kind of your genesis into off-roading, into the YouTube channel, where Bleep and Jeep started, where it came from, how you've gotten to where you are. And of course, getting to get some fun details about this uh, build challenge, the, the Jaguar and on this 12 valve chassis it's really cool so thank you so much for coming on yeah thanks for having me i appreciate it guys for sure jimmy do you have any final words to kind of close out the episode for all the listeners out there i just want to know what's going to be happening with that uh toyota truck that you pretty much stripped everything out of can you just send it to california and i'll just start building it up again i'll send it to you but we stripped all the good stuff out of it (laughs) All he wants is a body anyway. So <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Matt, any final words for everybody out there to close out the episode? Just get out there, have fun. Even if you don't have all the money in the world, you guys can do it. There's there's cheap options out there. Yeah, that's really cool. I like it. And that speaks to us as well. So everybody out there, thank you for listening. Matt, thanks for being on the show. Follow along on the build challenge. And remember, as always, keep crawling. Let me give you another joke because that one, one sucked. <laughs> I thought it was pretty good. <laughs> really? Yeah, no bull. Yeah, no <laughs> bull. You you probably know this one. Oh, okay. I would hope so. It's a classic. Uh, okay. It's a classic. A mushroom walks into the bar. Okay. And he goes up to the bartender. He says, hey, bartender, can I get a drink? The bartender says, no, you can't get a drink. And then the mushroom says... Why not? I'm a fun guy. You knew it. I knew you knew it. Good job, Tyler. Why uh, not? I'm yeah. a fun guy. I'm a fun guy. Come on. Yeah. Good job. Good job to you. I'm proud. Thank you. That's like two in the last 50. five years, six yeah. years. <laughs>